Welcome to Brentwood Lighthouse Baptist Church. So thankful to have you here today. If you're joining us uh, virtually online, welcome. Thank you for uh, tuning in for the Word of God to hear our message. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you, God, for blessing us. Thank you for being a glorious and a wonderful Father. Thank you, God, for giving us the gift of faith, for allowing us the honor and the privilege of knowing you, receiving your Son, hearing of the Word of God, and developing faith in our, in our minds and in our hearts to believe in you, Father. You are a wonderful, an awesome, an amazing, and a holy God, and a Father that is greater than anything that we could ever hope or imagine or ask for. We love you, Heavenly Father. May your name be proclaimed and your glory be revealed in this place today and always. We thank you for the gathering, Lord. Thank you for being our Father. In Jesus' name. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers here today as well. And you have a wonderful and a blessed day. We're going to be in James 2, 8 through 13 today. Um, I don't see Laura. I don't know if we're going to have children's ministry today. Favoritism is not of God. We're on the second part of uh, chapter 2. Favoritism is not of God, part 2. We're going to be in James 2, 8 through 13 today. So we'll be moving fast. If you're going to take notes, grab your pen and paper and be ready. And uh, someone has asked that I... Uh, repeat the, the verses that we go to. So we, if you notice, I'm going to repeat clearly when we go to a subsequent verse. That's why, so that uh, some of those who take notes have time to uh, jot that scripture number down, to turn to it, or to study them later. Last week, we found that God has shown himself to be greatly concerned for the poor and the underprivileged. He is also greatly honoring the spirit of humility. So we're learning about the poor and the underprivileged, how God's heart is for the poor, specifically in James 2, 1 through 7, God is declaring to us that favoritism is not from him. Poor and underprivileged are to be respected as anyone else. And God greatly honors the spirit of humility in each of his children. We've seen the examples in 1 through 7 last week of the underprivileged and the poor being mistreated over time in society in general, it's become a normal uh, form of treatment is for the poor to be mistreated. As well as we've seen the patterns and examples revealing that they are often treated unjustly. There's two things there, being mistreated, and the Bible says um, to the rich man, you sit up here in the front and the poor man, you stand over there is mistreated. Unjustly is the justice system or thoughts and minds of people are saying you deserve this and you don't deserve. So there's mistreatment and unjust treatment and God is specifically calling out. The summation of this biblical teaching that we're under right now, the lesson that we need to know is that when we show favoritism, when we choose one group over another, 
when we respect one person over another person based on class, race, anything that would possibly divide people, especially socioeconomic positions. When we show favoritism, we not only dishonor the poor and the underprivileged, but we dishonor Christ himself. And that is the lesson that I want you to learn. Christ is dishonored when you show favoritism. And if there's anything that needs to penetrate your heart today, it's that. Favoritism, partiality, is a loveless sin. We're going to go into the Bible reading, James 2, 8 through 13. Starting in verse 8. If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Okay, we're going to break this down a little bit. It's a powerful verse. Remember, James is to the point, pithy, they say. Right to the point and cutting edge. James is not mincing words. God is making his points directly. In verse 8, we see the term royal law. As we break this down, if, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. Now this one's kind of a misnomer as you read it. It says, if you are loving your neighbor as yourself, doing a really good job at that, then you are doing well. That's what it says in verse 8. If you are fulfilling the royal law, and you're going about your Christian life, loving your neighbor as yourself, then you are doing really well. <laughs> Needless to say, if you're not doing that, then to say, I guess you're not doing very well. If you're not loving your neighbor as yourself, you might not be doing so well. If you are fulfilling the royal law, and you're going to see how this breaks down today. The powerful scriptures with a lot of difficult concepts, and we're going to break it down. Verse 9 says, But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. In verse 8, we see there the term royal law. The royal law is the law fulfilled by Christ, which is summed up in the two greatest commandments. Supreme love for God, self-sacrificial love for others. The royal law is the law fulfilled by Christ, because no man is capable of completely fulfilling the law the law was given for us to know that we are incapable, that we are not able to fulfill it, ultimately that we are sinners. We're not good enough. No matter how good we try to be, we are pointed in the direction of Jesus Christ, who is the fulfillment of the royal law. To be self-sacrificial is the opposite of selfishness. 
Selfishness leads to a very small life. Self-sacrificial living leads to a robust, fulfilling life. To live self-sacrificially means we are willing to lay down our lives, our needs, or our desires with a conscious effort to benefit and help others. A vibrant, robust life is produced. And something I remember, I think, that really impacted me, and you're going to hear me share it from time to time, over and over, <clears throat> because it's so powerful. When you obey God's law, when you come together and read this word, dare I say, much of the Christian body, in my opinion, is not getting the depth of the word of God. We are growing in gospel culture. And I ask you, are you living in gospel culture or are you willing to live in worldly culture? Where are you? How are you mixing it up? And as your own analyst over your own life between you and God, the Bible says examine yourself. Are you living under worldly culture or gospel culture? A conscious effort to help others. Laying down your time, your needs, or your desires in a conscious effort to benefit and help others. Take a look at Matthew 22, 34 through 40. Matthew 22, 34 through 40 says, But when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together. One of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. There is Jesus speaking <clears throat> the two greatest commandments. Love the Lord God with all that you have and love your neighbor as yourself. Romans 13, 8 through 10. Romans 13, 8 through 10. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, and you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. Now if you can grasp hold for a minute how powerful the law of liberty is, how powerful loving your neighbor as yourself, anything that you would do for yourself, that you would do for someone else. The forgiveness, the exceptions, how easily you gloss over things when it comes to you. The magnitude of the blessing that you give yourself must be given to others. And you can see that that is a tall order. The Bible says if you're doing that, then you are fulfilling the royal law. And that is difficult for Christians. And it's impossible without God. Amen. Worldly culture is incapable of doing that. It's not possible. Goodness is only masked in society and behaviors. Jesus is our fulfillment of the law. To love one's neighbor as yourself 
to live self-sacrificial lives is the harder, more difficult path to walk. But it is also the path that leads to living lives greater than ourselves, and it is obedient to the royal law. Now, I'm going to say again where I started earlier, what we've learned that's so impactful is that as your life flourishes, as you're working in your life, as you're progressing in life, obeying God and reading this word and asking yourself, telling yourself, or forcing yourself to obey it. No one can force you, but you can force yourself. You act with force. What am I going to do as a Christian? What have I learned and what do I know? This is the path that leads to living lives greater than yourselves, and it is obedient to the royal law, following the path of obedience to God. If I force myself to be obedient to the word of God, not to live under worldly culture, we don't live that way. I'm not confused about it. I don't dislike anybody. I'm not against anybody. But I love God, and I'm living under gospel culture. To live under gospel culture and to obey God's word is God's plan for my life to flourish. Amen? And that is the secret. That is the key of living the Christian life and flourishing and blossoming like a tree that is planted by living water that is constantly in bloom. Obeying God and his word causes your life to flourish. So look at your life. Examine yourself. How are you flourishing? What is your struggle? And come into obedience to the word of God and find yourself flourished. Just knowing the purpose is the magnitude of the lesson. Knowing that following God causes my life to overflow with blessings, strength, courage, to flourish overwhelmingly, and there's no better planner than a loving Father, a beautiful, holy, all-powerful, all-knowing, loving Father guiding your life. Amen? <clears throat> Partiality is sin, and those who practice it are transgressors. Very simple in verse 9. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Very simple. Partiality is out. Galatians 2.14. Watch how some of these verses come together as we move on. Galatians 2.14 says, But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, in the presence of all. If you, being a Jew, live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? Here we have Paul correcting Peter Cephas as he was favoring Jewish life over the Gentiles. Peter was living with them. He was dwelling with them, eating with them, and suddenly when the Jews came, he was hanging out with them. And he began doing the things that Jews do and looking down or even despising the very people that he was with previously. And he was called out as a transgressor. Amen? Proof that the Bible says if you show favoritism, if you get caught favoring one group over another, rich over poor, race, creed, color, anything, that favoritism is not from God. Peter was called out rightfully. Favoritism is iniquity because it breaks the law. James 2, 10 through 11. Starting in 2, 10. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Now if you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. In verse 10, I want to clarify 
uh, something that's long been in my heart as I read this, uh, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point has become guilty of all. A little clarity on that verse. It's not as if you broke every law. You're not guilty of breaking every law. The unity of Christ is as a picture a window. And when you tap, poosh, it shatters. And that is the clarity of that verse. To break one law is to tap on God's perfect unity and whoosh, the whole picture is gone. And that's why the Bible says to stumble at one part is to shatter the perfect unity that exists in God's law. And we are incapable of doing that. Our glass will shatter. He who breaks one part of it shatters the entire unity of God's perfection. Giving you an idea of how feeble we are in our ability to be perfect. Take a look at Matthew 5.19. Matthew 5.19 says, Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now we're coming down to a precept that I'm going to teach you that's very difficult. Jesus just said, if you listen to my word and strive to obey it, seek to obey it, pray to obey it, or dare I say, force yourself. You can't force me. But I can tell you in my testimony that there was a time when I forced myself. And I told myself, it's not going to happen to me again, God. Because I struggled in my youth. It's not going to happen. I'm not going to let that happen. Can I be perfect? No. But I forced myself between me and God to say, I'm not letting it happen. Things a couple of weeks ago, or last week, I said no to, no to this, no to that, no to this behavior, no to that behavior. These behaviors were in my path, and I forced myself to reject them. No, 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 and no. Amen? That is only between you and God. You are capable of doing that. You are capable of saying no. It's not easy. Only you can do that upon yourself. Christians, do not force one another. We love each other. Amen? Very personal. Remember, James is personal. He's getting into our minds and our hearts at a depth and a level that is incredibly personal. And it's beautiful. Here we understand the consequence of practicing disobedience or teaching disobedience to any of God's word is to be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Determining rank in the kingdom of heaven is entirely God's prerogative. So back to Matthew 519, I want to make this clear. 519 says, whoever that annulled one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So, if I teach you not to obey this word, not to force yourself to obey, not to check yourself and exemplify yourself before God, then I, I risk being called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Anyone who refuses to learn this word and obey it or teach others so there is the premise for my teaching. I can't force another pastor. Remember, we don't force people. We love people. I can't force another pastor, but I'll tell you what I'm reading now. Any pastor who teaches believers to do anything contrary to this word and to understand this word and to live by its precepts shall be called the what? The least in the kingdom of heaven. This is eye-opening. Matthew 20, 23. There's more in this. This is really powerful bone cutting. Matthew 20, 23 says, He said to them, 
my cup you shall drink, but to sit on my right hand and on my left, this is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my Father. Jesus declares that he will hold those in lowest esteem who hold his word in low esteem. We're talking about Christians. We're talking about believers. We're talking about believers. You will get to heaven if you are a true believer, and you're going to see how this breaks down. You see, we get confused. As a believer, I've often been confused. Well, there's unbelievers. There's unredeemed. I know that they're not going to heaven. They haven't got Jesus in their heart. And then there's the redeemed. These are people who love Jesus. But as we say it, May I say, there's many in the Christian church that are not being taught the depth of this word, that are not living in gospel culture. Perhaps they're Christians redeemed who are living under worldly culture. See, there's the paradigm. There's unredeemed and there's redeemed. I know that. You know that. But are there redeemed who live under worldly culture instead of gospel culture. And I tell you, don't listen to what I say. Listen to what God says. Redeemed believers who fail to learn this word, who fail to obey this word, who fail to sit under this word, and God forbid that there's no one teaching them to obey it because the teacher himself and the redeemed believers who fail to understand and live according to this word to the best of their ability, I can force myself. You can't force me, but I can force myself. The Bible says, Jesus declares, I will dub you the least in the kingdom of heaven. Well, that's kind of shocking. It's not what I'm saying. Listen to the Bible. Listen to what God said. He will be called the greatest. He will be called the least. And the only prerogative that is given is for the Father. Jesus said, only my Father is the one who positions people in heaven. Take a look at Galatians 5, 13 and 14. Watch how this continues to unfold. Galatians 5, 13 and 14. For you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, how many times in New Testament scripture have you seen love your neighbor as yourself just today? It was at least three or four times you've seen it in different scriptures. Love your neighbor as yourself. Do not use your freedom. Twelve and thirteen. Let's read James two, twelve and thirteen. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. These are the last two verses. We continue to break this down. Here in 12 and 13, James issues an injunction against favoritism. An injunction is an authoritative warning or an order to restrain from a behavior. So we have an injunction against favoritism. A reference back to James 2.1 quickly, where we started last week in the beginning. James chapter 2 verse 1 says, My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. 
We need to gain wisdom and be obedient in our speech and action because we will be judged according to the law of liberty. Let me read 2.12 again. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. Now, unredeemed and redeemed. This is not for unredeemed. It is impossible for unredeemed people to speak and act accordingly. This is for the redeemed. So you redeem Christians, so speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. A Christian, and I'm going to be judged by the law of liberty? This is not unredeemed. As a Christian, did you know that you're going to be judged according to God's word? Read it for yourself in James verse 12. Speak and act, all Christians, as those who will be judged by the perfect law of liberty. That opened my eyes. This really opens my eyes. Now keep in mind, as redeemed, you're getting into heaven. Only between you and God knows your heart if you've given your life to Jesus. We're speaking of redeemed. And you're going to see a little more about that. In Old Testament and New Testament, God's perfect word is called law. So the law of perfect liberty, as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. We're going to break this down a little bit. In the Old Testament and the New Testament, God's perfect word is called law. <clears throat> the presence of his grace, the redeeming grace that saved you, does not mean there is no moral law or code of conduct for believers to obey. The presence of God's saving grace that saved you when you gave your life to Jesus Christ and put your faith in him does not mean there is no moral law or code of conduct. There I say we come in jeopardy with, I say, Christians who are living under worldly culture. Is that possible? I'm not the judge. Or Christians who are living and being taught and are fervently listening, reading, and discovering and fellowship in this word and literally asking God to help them live in obedience to it. The Bible says there's a difference. So if you're a Christian, I challenge you to prove me wrong. Prove me wrong that God didn't say some Christians will be called the least in the kingdom and some Christians will be called the greatest and the magnitude of that command from Jesus, that declaration is based on listening to this word and obeying it. I'm not perfect at it. I'm still trying to be better. And I pray that the magnitude of these scriptures today are going to encourage you and help you to do the same. The law of liberty is genuine freedom from sin. The perfect law of liberty is genuine freedom from sin. In the Old Testament and the New Testament, God's word is called the law. The presence of his grace does not mean there's no moral code and standard of conduct for believers. So God's standard of conduct, God's moral code, God's perfect word is genuine freedom from sin. Amen? And we need to understand that. That's why we say the beauty of his word, the perfection of his word, the law of liberty, the law of freedom from sin is here in this book. Are you studying it? Are you a Christian that understands that? Do you understand that God just happened to say, Jesus just happened to declare it. You don't take time to understand that. You're going to be called the least where? In heaven. In heaven. You will be there. Yes, you are redeemed. These open my eyes. All of you are striving. All of you are excellent. All of you have beautiful gifts and talents. Many of you can do things that I could never dream of doing. And I respect that, and I love you for that. But God is the author of faith, and he is asking us together to do something. 
that he is asking us to do. It's not of our own doing. Use the skills you have, the magnitude of the blessings you've been given from God, and hone yourself in on these teachings. You will grow. The law of liberty is genuine freedom from sin. This, obeying this book, is genuine freedom from sin. As the Holy Spirit applies the principles of Scripture to believers, to their hearts, they are freed from sin's bondage, and they are enabled to obey God. As the Holy Spirit applies the principle of Scripture to believers' hearts, are you in a place where the Scripture is being applied? I've been in places where I came in and the leader of the church just said, today the Holy Spirit's going to do everything for you. He's got all the answers. He's going to do everything. It felt really good. I was temporarily lifted up. But there was no scriptural basis. And I discovered that that was the foundation of the general feeling was that you got the Holy Spirit. It's all good. But as I learned and grew, and my flourishing may have stumbled a little bit, because obeying the word is, is the precipice for flourishing, not just loving God and the Holy Spirit. That is the foundation of the death on the cross and forgiveness of sin. As the Holy Spirit applies these scriptures, right now he's applying these scriptures to your heart. Am I the least or the greatest in heaven, God? I'm redeemed. I'm not unredeemed. I know that I'm redeemed. Where do I sit? What is my position? How can I improve it? And I want to use all my blessings and gifts and magnitude to do that. And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit will free you from sin's bondage and enable you to obey God. 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 15, as we start to wind down. 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 15. I want you to listen to this, and I'll explain it. You may have heard it before. I pray that the Holy Spirit will enable you through his power to understand. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 10 through 15. According to the grace of God which was given to me like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw. Each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it, because it is to be revealed with fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved. Yet so as through fire. Incredible verse. Yes, you will be saved. Yes, you are redeemed. God is placing it in your hands with your courage and your strength and your power and your will through the power of the Holy Spirit to hear his word and to transform your life. I've always said something God gave me years ago as a discipleship strategy. Receive him into your heart, transform your life, and glorify him through living. Receive, transform, and glorify. God is telling you through his scripture, you will be saved. See, there are redeemed and unredeemed. The unredeemed will not be saved. 
So you can be redeemed and not grasp hold of the scripture. How important is it? It became really important to me in my life, in my journey. It became of the utmost importance. It became fiery important. It became super important for me as a Christian to understand the precepts of this word and to do my best. Am I perfect at it? No. I am not perfect at it. But I know in my heart and mind where my flourishing is. It is involving this word. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. A shepherd takes care of the sheep. He's guiding you and loving you and encouraging you. Would the shepherd lead you to a fiery pit where you barely escaped a bramble bush looking like you were charbroiled? Would the shepherd lead you that way? Is that his desire to lead you? He will pull you out. He will bring you in as redeemed. We're going to read 13 now, so we're closing it out, but it's very powerful. Verse 13, James 2, 13, for judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Okay, we're going to deal with the those who show no mercy first. We're going to deal with the word of God. A person who shows no mercy and compassion for people in need... He demonstrates that he has never responded to the great mercy of God. And as an unredeemed person will receive only strict unrelieved judgment in eternal hell. There's unredeemed there's redeemed, and there are redeemed who listen. There are redeemed who want to learn. All are loved by God. All have a choice. I can't think of anyone laying it out any better. In my 30 years as a Christian, no one ever laid it out as well as it's just been laid out today. There's unbelievers, and there's believers, and there's believers who really dig in this word and listen. And God has made promises and blessings and declarations over believers who will listen and follow this word. And dare I say, much of the Christian body is not in tune with the word and living. They're living in worldly culture, not gospel culture. Amen? It takes work. The dream comes through much effort. Solomon. We read it in Ecclesiastes. The dream comes through much effort. To those who are merciless, there is only judgment that awaits the unredeemed. Mercy triumphs over judgment. A person who shows mercy and compassion for others who are in need, he or she demonstrates that they have responded to the great mercy of God. The Bible warns that those who have no mercy will receive no mercy from God, the unredeemed. You won't have any confusion today. The redeemed have mercy. They will come through even as one who narrowly escaped the flames. You've heard it in God's word. The redeemed have a command to obey a flourishing plan from God that is right in front of them. Many are not privy. The person whose life is characterized by mercy is ready for the day of judgment and will escape all the charges that strict justice might bring against him because by showing mercy to others, he gives genuine evidence of having received God's mercy. No greater scripture can compel your heart to be merciful. Show mercy. Be merciful. God is merciful, and he has sent his son Jesus Christ to take our place 
under punishment on his cross. By his stripes we are healed. In closing today, if you've never responded to the good news, to the gospel of Jesus Christ, if you've never actually committed your life to Christ, you've heard the truth of God's word today. The unredeemed will only receive merciless treatment from God. He has no choice. Your sin is upon you, and he cannot allow that sin into heaven with him. There's only one way to have your sin forgiven. Take a look at Ephesians 1, 7. Let's read together. Ephesians 1, 7. In him we have redemption, redeemed through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. There you hear it in one verse. In him, in Jesus Christ, we are redeemed. We have redemption. You have the redeemed and the unredeemed. You have the redeemed that are listening and obeying, and you have the redeemed that are struggling. All redeemed will be in heaven. We are redeemed through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. If you're listening today and you haven't responded, you haven't trusted Jesus Christ to forgive you of your trespasses, your sins, and opened your heart, will you receive him today? Will you open your heart to God's mercy and grace, which is the only way for you to be given the gift of eternal life? If that's you today, we can begin with a prayer. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, I open my heart to you today. I confess my sin and my transgressions. And I ask you, Father, to forgive me. Redeem me into your kingdom through the precious blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for his death, burial, and resurrection, and that you gave him to suffer the penalty that I deserved. God, today, I ask your Son, Jesus, to be my Savior to forgive me of my sin, and I make him Lord of my life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 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 As you prayed that prayer, if you watch them virtually, please surround yourself with Christian people. Come to a church where the Bible is being taught. Commit yourself. Pray that you can come under obedience to God's word. You will flourish like never before. Let's have a song with Sister Yuki, and then I'll close this with prayer.
Let's start. Uh, trust and obey is number 323 Okay, here we go. Let's go. One, two, three, one, and when we walk, we struggle. your children, Father, not only here, Lord, but all over our nation and all over our world, Lord. Give them the message to trust and obey. Help them and encourage them, Lord, each one of us, all your family. Send the Holy Spirit to open our eyes and ears to the flourishing obedience of your word, God. Help us to grow and to live in this world according to gospel culture, the culture that we are designed to live by, God. And we thank you and we praise you, Father, that you loved us enough to send your Son to die for us. And you redeemed us through that precious death and that blood on the cross. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And everyone said? Amen. 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 Dismissed. But thank you all. Please meet and greet. Share with someone. Say hello. Spend a few minutes of meeting and greeting. Thank you for coming today. Thank you so much. <laughs>